During the past few weeks, we've talked a lot about God's love, about his personality, about his character and how much he loves his people, how he uh, has battled for his people, how he saves his people, he protects his people, he sent his son for his people. He loves humanity. He loves his creation. And the reason that we started this series once again was because there has been a serious attack on the character of God, on the love that God has for people. And a lot of people today look around the world and they see the things that are happening and it's causing them to make a decision. Either they're for God or they're against God. And this seems to be the case throughout history, throughout the Bible. There have been times through the Bible where you're either going to be for God or you're going to be against God. And in the, the accounts that we've looked at recently in the book of Exodus, these are the things that we've looked at. Look at how God stood up for his people, how he saved his people. He brought them out of Egypt. He, he cared for them in the wilderness. He cared for them through the Red Sea. He brought them to this place called Mount Sinai, and he, he said, make me a place. He wanted to dwell among them. Make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. We looked at that last week. He wants to be with his people. So he's preparing them to be with him. And let's face it, if we're going to be in the presence of a holy God, we must ourselves be holy. And we look and we say, well, that's, that's really difficult. But how do we learn about God? Has he changed? Is he different? Did he change anything at Sinai? Did something happen at Mount Sinai that, that caused everything to shift? The reason I'm asking that question is because so many people, and I was one of them, that... I used to believe that the Ten Commandments came into existence at Mount Sinai because this is where God vocalized them in Exodus chapter 20. In fact, if you open your Bibles to Exodus 20, we read Exodus 19 last week. This is the first time in the Bible, this is the first time that we see the commandments actually listed and spelled out for us, so to speak. And right before God speaks these words, he had brought, as we saw last week, he had brought his people to the bottom of Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up the mountain. And he's about to hear the words of God. And why does God do this? Is this something that was new? And I want you to ask yourself, as we read through, we're just going to read through these commandments, and then we're going to go back and look and see if any of these were different than what any of the patriarchs and prophets of old were taught previously. Because if they, if they were different, that means that God must change somehow, or he changed something. So the question we're going to ask and attempt to answer today from the Bible is, did the Ten Commandments exist? Did all of them exist before Sinai? Now, I've spoken about this. I gave a sermon on this about seven, almost eight years ago. It was about seven years ago. And um, when I did, I touched on just a couple of things. Well, you know, the more you read the Bible, the more you learn. And I've learned a lot of things since then, and I know I will continue to learn a lot of things. So I thought it, was, it would be good to go back and revisit this topic since we've come to it again in Scripture. So let's just begin here in Exodus chapter 20, and we'll just begin in verse 1. It says, and God spoke all these words. So God is speaking. He's speaking, saying, I am Jehovah your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, Jehovah your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who keep, who, I'm sorry, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of Jehovah your God in vain, for Jehovah will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. 
But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Jehovah your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Jehovah blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which Jehovah your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So we're going to stop right here because we just read through, that's Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. We see the commandments of God here. So again, I'm going to ask, is this where the commandments started? Is this where they began? Well, I have quite a few PowerPoint slides. We will be referring to our Bibles, but for the sake of expediency and looking at these verses quickly, I've put a lot of texts in the PowerPoint today. So let's look first at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. And this is from the King James Bible. 1 John 3, 4 on the PowerPoint, it says, Whosoever committeth, committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. What does that mean to you? Doesn't that mean that if there's no law, there's no sin? There's no law, there can't be sin. Well, let's look at it in the New King James Version. It might clear it up a little bit. It says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. So lawless means if I'm acting in a lawless way, then there must be a law for me to be lawless. So sin is... Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And then I've got Romans 4.15 that I wanted to look at, and this is actually from the easy-to-read version. It says here, because the law can only bring God's anger on those who disobey it, but if there is no law, then there is nothing to disobey. That makes it pretty clear. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. You've heard this illustration. Brother Ed just used it the other day about the law and transgression of the law. I'm going to use a different one this time. If I'm driving down the road and I come to an intersection and I go through that intersection without stopping and a police officer pulls me over and says, you didn't stop at the intersection. And I, and I look back and I say, well, there's no stop sign there. And he looks and says, well, there isn't a stop sign there. Can he give me a ticket for not stopping at a stop sign that's not there? No. He can't. There's no stop sign. What do you mean you're giving me a ticket? It doesn't say to stop. I just, I was following the law. I was within the law. So if there's no law to stop, I'm not breaking the law. But if there's a stop sign, now I'm breaking the law. I come under the penalty of the law. He can ticket me and I have to pay the fine. I have to suffer the consequence of breaking the law. So when we read a text that says, for where there is no law, there is no transgression, if a law doesn't exist, I cannot be sinning. It's impossible. So let's begin by going back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to take a look at something that we're all very familiar with. We're just going to read Genesis 3, 1 through 7, and we'll discuss this for a moment. It says here, Genesis 3, in verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which Jehovah God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4, then the serpent said to the woman, 
you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. We'll just stop right there. So let me ask you, did Satan, did the serpent lie to the woman? You will not surely die. She said that, that if she does, she will die. God told them that if they eat from it, they will die. So when the serpent says, you will not surely die, is he lying? Absolutely. It's a lie. Was that a sin? Was it a sin for him to do that? Well, if you shall not lie or you shall not bear false witness didn't exist, this could not be held against the devil for lying. And we're going to uncover this more as we go through. In fact, let's take a look. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. It says, he who sins is of the devil. This is on the PowerPoint. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So it says, again, look at the verse, the devil has sinned from the beginning. So it must have been a sin for the devil to lie. So you shall not bear false witness or you shall not lie must have existed for the devil to have sinned in the garden. It had to be. If there's no law, there's no transgression. So here he broke the ninth commandment which we really, we didn't see in writing until Exodus chapter 20. But notice Jesus' words. Jesus says this about this situation. John 8, on the PowerPoint, he's speaking to the Pharisees. He says, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So not only did he break the ninth commandment in lying, but he also is a murderer. He broke the sixth commandment. What makes him a murderer? The fact that he lied to Eve and caused Adam and Eve to eat the fruit, this makes him a murderer. They willingly ate the fruit, but he deceived Eve. He's a murderer. That's what, he was a murderer from the beginning. We'll talk about that a little more. James 2 verse 10 tells us that if we break one commandment, what have we done? We've broken them all. That's what Brother Roy just said. They've broken them all. If we break one, we've broken them all. So when he's a liar, he's also a murderer. And, and you'll see how, how intricate all of these commandments are as, as we go through and how they're interrelated. How can I break, break them all by breaking one? Is that even possible? Well, let's take a look now at Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And Cain said, I have acquired a man from Jehovah. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to Jehovah. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And Jehovah respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So Jehovah said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Verse 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, what's that next word? Sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So let me ask you, if the law didn't come into place until Sinai, God's using this word sin. It couldn't be sinning if there was no law till Sinai. It couldn't have been sin for Cain to kill Abel until Sinai. But it is. 
because the commandment existed. When Jesus said you were a murderer from the beginning, this is the first cold-blooded murder that took place in the Bible. Who do you think put it in the mind of Cain to kill Abel? It was that serpent of old, the one called devil and Satan. And you see, the reason why he did this is because when we look at the promise that's made in Genesis 3.15 about the seed that would crush the serpent's head, he's trying to prevent this from happening. So he causes Cain to kill Abel, who was the one that was going to be the seed originally. And we know that because of the lineage of Seth. We've talked about this many times before. We look at uh, chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 25. It says, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. So she knew that Cain killed Abel. She knew that he was a murderer. She knew this was wrong. Cain himself knew this was wrong. God was telling him that it was wrong. It was a sin. God even said it. Sin lies at the door. Just turn the other way. That's all you have to do. You can walk away from it. So if there was no law, there could be no sin. So what's that tell us? There had to be a law about sinning. In fact, uh, take a look at 1 John chapter 3. Once again, 1 John chapter 3 on the PowerPoint, verses 10 through 12. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard just recently. No, from the beginning that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. So here we have one, one man that was a righteous man and one man was an unrighteous man. Right there, not long after the Garden of Eden. What was the gauge as to whether one was righteous or unrighteous? It was the law. That's what tells us. That's the litmus test, the law. That's the Constitution, the law of God. There's more in Genesis, though. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, and I want you to notice um, verse it says, Then Jehovah saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil, was only evil continually. Well, if it was evil, there had to be something to measure what's good or evil. How do we measure that? If we call somebody a bad person today, what do we measure that by? We usually measure that by the laws of the land. The laws of the land that we live in, in this country, are loosely based on the commandments of God. And I say that now. It used to be pretty well solid there, but, you know, fairly well. But now it seems to be that that is loosening. But we gauge their goodness by the laws that they are breaking or keeping. I want you to notice verses 11 and 12 in Genesis chapter 6. It says, The earth also, in verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. You see, so here we have these corrupt people. If you look back at verse 8, it says, But Noah found grace in the sight of Jehovah, in the eyes of Jehovah. So it's interesting to me. We have righteous ones, like Noah, like Abel, and we have unrighteous ones, like the rest of the world in Noah's day, and like Cain. And what judges whether they're righteous or unrighteous? The law of God. It's really pretty simple, isn't it? So the law had to exist for these statements to be made in the Bible. For Cain to be penalized, even though he was penalized, God still protected him. 
So we can see God's love even there. Uh, take a look here at Genesis chapter 13. We're just going to look at a couple more things here, and then we're going to move along. Genesis 13, 12 and 13, it says, Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before Jehovah exceedingly. That's from the modern King James Bible. So how could there be sinning if there's no law again? This is before. This is in Genesis. This is early on in the history of humanity. This is a couple of thousand years after man was created, but before the Ten Commandments were actually given vocally from God to Moses. 2 Peter chapter 2 mentions this. 2 Peter 2, 5 and 6. God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. In other words, without law. It continues, and delivered righteous Lot, calls Lot righteous, and was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their what? Lawless deeds. If their deeds were lawless, there must have been a law to identify that those deeds were, in fact, lawless. Where there's no law, there's no transgression. Yet so many Christians will say, well, the law didn't come into place until Sinai. Is that true? Well, let's take a look at God's promise to Isaac in Genesis chapter 26. You see, we're working our way through Genesis here. Genesis chapter 26 on the PowerPoint, verses 1 through 3, it says, And there was a famine in the land, besides the famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, to Gerar. And Jehovah appeared to him and said, Do not go down into Egypt. Live in the land which I tell you of. Reside in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your seed I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I will make your seed to multiply as the stars of the heavens, and will give to your seed all these lands. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept, what? My charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So how could anyone say that the commandments or the laws didn't exist until Sinai when here you have it spelled out for you? How could he keep commandments he didn't know about? How could he keep laws that he didn't understand? Abraham kept God's law. And this was the seed through which the Messiah came. And that's what this is talking about. This is what was promised in Genesis 3.15. God is looking for people who love him, who keep his commandments, that can propagate the truth and that can be with him for eternity because he loves those who love him. Isn't that true? Typically, if somebody loves you, it causes you to want to love them. God loves those who love him. He loves those who doesn't love him. He sent his son to die for everyone to give them an opportunity to learn to love him. It's amazing to me. Genesis chapter 39. Let's turn there for just a moment. Genesis 39. We haven't even got out of Genesis yet. And look at all of these examples we have so far. Genesis chapter 39, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him into the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. And Jehovah was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that Jehovah was with him, and that the Jehovah made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in the sight of in his sight, and served him. 
Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was that from that time he made him overseer of the house, and that all that he had, and Jehovah blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of Jehovah was on all that he had in the house of the, and in the field. And thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused. And said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know uh, what is with me in the house. And he has committed all that he has into my hand. There is, one, there is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you. Because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness, and what? Sin against God. You see, Pharaoh wanted, Pharaoh's wife wanted to sleep with Joseph. And he said, if I do this because she's married, it's a sin. You shall not commit adultery. But the Bible doesn't say that before. But it's there. It's obvious. Joseph knows this is a sin. I cannot do this. So we've looked at a few. We've looked at a few commandments. These are the ones that I've talked about before. But the question that, I, that we have to answer is, did every commandment exist before Sinai? So we've talked about murder. We've talked about um, stealing. We've talked about, well, we didn't talk about stealing, but we will. We, we've talked about, uh, let's see, murder. Uh, uh, help me out, guys. Lying. Thank you. Lying and adultery, right? And then we saw that Abraham kept the commandments, plural. Well, it could have just been those three. But let's, let's talk about the rest of them. We're going to look at each commandment. And let's begin with the first one. We'll do this in order. Sorry, I was drawing a blank there. I couldn't, couldn't get my thoughts. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Did this exist before Sinai? Well, notice Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12. This is before Sinai. It's in Exodus. But notice what it says. This is from the modern King James Bible. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and I will execute judgments against what? All the gods of Egypt, I am Jehovah. This happened before Moses went to Sinai. God's law against other gods certainly existed for him to execute judgment against those gods. It had to. In fact, let's just take a brief moment because I was talking with somebody not too long ago and, and they had recently were, were studying and they said, wow, did you realize that God humiliated a different God for each, false God that is, Jehovah God uh, humiliated a false God for each one of the ten plagues. And we didn't cover that. I mentioned it, but we didn't cover it when we went through the ten plagues. So I just thought we'd take a couple of minutes just to take a look at how God did this and what's he doing in each one of these. He's revealing his character. Because remember, these Israelites had been in Egypt for 430 years. So there they were. They were in captivity. And what can happen when we're indoctrinated like that with falseness is that we begin to forget. So what he's doing is he's, he's going to show them his love by revealing who he is and humiliating their false gods. The first one that we come across here in Plague 1 was Hepi or Hepi. It depends on... Uh, how you look at it. And this, we know the first plague was turning the water to blood in the Nile River. And all the fish died, the river stank, the death of the fish in the Nile was just, it was huge. It was a huge blow, not only to their religion, but also to their economy at the time. And uh, there were even certain kinds of fish that were uh, venerated at that time. Here's another uh, photograph. This is actually a photograph of 
one of the caves that are in Egypt uh, even to this day. And it's showing this false god. So uh, lots of, all of the fish died in the river, so it also was a blow to the fish god as well when he did this. And there was a fish god called Dagon. Uh, the next plague, the second plague, this is the Egyptian goddess Hecht, and this is actually the frog god. If you remember, the frogs came up out of the river and they were in their houses, they were in their food and the clothing. They were everywhere. And the frog in that day regarded a symbol of fertility in the Egyptian beliefs. So what's he doing there? It was actually, when they believed in the frog, they had a concept of resurrection. And so he's saying, hey, I can destroy your god, this god that you believe is of resurrection. And this was actually the frog goddess. It wasn't necessarily a god. It was a female. And that's why it was a fertility god. And so the plague of the frogs actually disgraced this false goddess, Hecht. The third plague in Exodus uh, chapter 8, verses 16 through 19, was Geb or Geb. It depends on uh, who you ask. And this was the, the lice that came up. And you can see there's actually a drawing there, and then you'll see an actual photograph of what they found in a cave. And this plague actually saw the magic-practicing priests acknowledging defeat, and they proved to be unable to do their miracles. This was the god they were calling on when they called on the god to be able to get rid of the dust from the, the dust into gnats. And if you remember, they said, because they couldn't do anything about this, they said, this is the finger of God, because they figured this god, Geb, or Geb, was very, very powerful. And it was actually a god of the earth. You know, it's interesting uh, that today people seem to want to worship the earth. It seems like things are going back to this time, doesn't it? All of the things that are happening. Uh, the fourth plague, uh, the fourth plague here, this was the swarms of flies. And this took the plagues to a completely different level than the first three because now we're, it's affecting just the Egyptians. It's, God is isolating his judgment. Now, I circled there. You'll notice in that red circle, it's actually uh, looks like a bug there. And uh, this, is, this was the god, uh, I think it's Kepri. I think that's how you pronounce that. Um, and this was, there were swarms of these flies that invaded the homes of the Egyptians, and the Israelites uh, didn't have any in their homes. I find that interesting that the bugs targeted only the Egyptians. Again, showing the love of God to protect his people. The fifth plague, this is, this is uh, Hathor. And this was where there was death of cattle and livestock, and there was pestilence among the livestock. And, and it dominantly humiliated humiliated this goddess that you see here. Again, another female god. They used a lot of female gods. And uh, this, this Hathor or Hathor, but it was also a blow to the, their deities such as Apis, the sky goddess, Nut. And also there was a, if you notice, this cow that they have on top of this, the horns of a cow. And then in that ball, that's almost like uh, uh, some kind of a birthing egg. It's really interesting how these people come to these false believings. But this was actually, again, a plague that only affected the Egyptians. And then we have this, uh, Isis, and this is not to be confused with the uh, Islamic Isis today. So when you see that, that, this is not what it's talking about. And this was the plague of the boils that brought disgrace uh, on the people. And it actually humiliated their gods and goddesses regarding their healing abilities. They had gods called Thoth, and another one called, it's with a P, but I think the P is silent. It's called Ta, P-T-A-H is how that's spelled. And you'll notice there, you see the, uh, the Egyptian cave on the right, and then you see the drawings of this Isis there. And God humiliated that God as well. Jehovah God humiliated this false God. Uh, the seventh plague. I tried to circle it there so you could see this image. This is the god Nut, which was also uh, back in the, uh, humiliated back in the uh, second plague. And so when we look at this, this was a severe hailstorm that actually shamed the gods that supposedly have control over the elements. You know, it's interesting. This is a female god. And what do people call nature today? They call it Mother Nature. 
Have you noticed that? Where do you think we adopted that from? You know, it comes from things like this. And this god, Nut, was supposed to have uh, control over all of the elements. And there, was, uh, there were other gods, like uh, Reshpu, who appears and was believed to control lightning. And then Thoth, who was uh, said to have power over rain and thunder. The word Thoth, thunder, sounding like Thoth. Thoth. And then we have the eighth plague. Now, uh, it's interesting that this uses the, uh, the uh, name Seth. Of course, to the Egyptians, that means something different than it did to the Hebrews. This was the locust plague, and this actually uh, was showing that God would defeat their harvest god. And uh, this actually, and again, one of these gods, these other false gods that go along with this one is the god Min, who is viewed as a protector of crops. So this was the locust plague that ate up everything in sight. Uh, the ninth plague was darkness. And, of course, you know, the devil disguises himself as an angel of light, but these people also have gods of darkness, which we know truly that's what the devil is. He is a god of darkness. And this is the, the god Ra, which actually is a sun god. Isn't that interesting? A sun god. And this plague of darkness, uh, he was actually humiliating their sun god, Ra and Horus. And also Thoth, the god of the moon, and they believed that the, uh, this Ra was the organizer of the sun, moon, and stars. Some say Re, but I believe it's Ra, R-A. And then, of course, the, the last plague, the one that most people are very familiar with, is the death of the firstborn. And what this did, this, this actually humiliated every e Egyptian god because every Egyptian god was supposed to have some kind of control over life. And it actually humiliated Pharaoh also because the pharaohs of those days were looked at as gods. They were viewed as gods. And he had no control over this. There was nothing he could do. The death of the firstborn. And this was the greatest humiliation of all the gods and goddesses of Egypt. And it's amazing that these rulers in Egypt styled themselves as gods uh, after, the, after Ra. They wanted to have light, but they were really leading people to darkness, much like the devil. He's the angel of light, right? He disguises himself, but he's really darkness. So we can see all of those things. And what a blow this was to Egypt that this took place. And we know that the only way to get out of that, God made a way out, as we saw before, by taking the saving power of the blood of the Lamb and putting it over the doorposts and on the sides. And so I just, I just wanted to share this with you because it's, it's so important that we understand when we, when we look here, let me just turn back there again uh, to Exodus 20 to give me my, my foundation there. So when we look here and we say, have no other gods before me, God says. And then through those ten plagues, he humiliated all those gods and showed that this is the reason why. They can't help you with anything. They can't help you with anything. You know, years ago, several, quite a few years ago, the question was asked, what separates the true God from a false God? Well, these false gods could do nothing. Nothing, absolutely nothing. They're said to have these powers, but can they really do anything? No. There was nothing they could do against the power that God had showed. And these false gods, they have to carve them, they have to make them, they have to worship them. They seek after the false gods. But you see, the true God, what's he do? He seeks after you. He comes for you. He comes to protect you. He wants a relationship with you. These other gods can't have a relationship because they're just objects of stone and wood, parts of the elements that God created, and they carve them and say, this is our God. But the God Jehovah, he doesn't want any other gods before him because he loved you so much that he gave his son. Show him a little respect, right? The second commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. You shall not make to yourselves any graven image on the PowerPoint or any likeness of anything that is in the heavens above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow yourself down to them nor serve them. 
For I, Jehovah your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons to the third and fourth generation of those who, that hate me, and showing mercy to thousands of those that love me and keep my commandments. Hundreds of years earlier, God was working with the patriarch Jacob. And after God spoke to Jacob, I want you to notice what he did with the idols that were among his household. Take a look. Genesis 35, verses 1 through 3. And God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Then Jacob said to his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods among you and be clean and change your garments and let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the day of which I went. I want you to focus on a couple of things. Make an altar to God. I highlighted that. But then down in verse 2 it says, put away the strange gods among you. What's that mean? Have no false gods before him. Put them away. And then it says, and be clean and change your garments. You know, we see here God in Exodus last week when we look at verse, at verse chapter 19, we saw that God wanted them to wash their garments and make them clean. And when we come to God, doesn't he wash our garments? Doesn't he make us clean? Aren't we supposed to stand clean before him? How can I do that if I'm worshiping false gods? I can't if I, if I put another God before him or if I have an idol among me. I can't. I can't do that. I have to be clean. I have to change my dirty garments and put on clean garments before God. But notice, again, in 35 verse 4, the account continues. And they have all the strange gods. This is that same account we just read, Genesis 35 verse 4. And they gave all the strange gods... They gave all the strange gods which were in their hands to Jacob and the earrings in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. So we see Jason, Jacob understood what? The importance of getting rid of idols and only worshiping the true God. He knew he had to put these things away. The third commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. This is from the mod all of the commandments I have here from the modern King James, just so you know. It says, You shall not take the name of Jehovah your God in vain, for Jehovah will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So when we see that word name, a lot of times we think it's just the, the actual name. Don't use the name in vain. But really, when we're talking about the name, we're talking about the reputation of God, his reputation. It, it's kind of like if, if, I just say, if I just say the name Ed, you might know five or six Eds. Or if I say Rick, you might know five or six Ricks or Roy or Mary, whoever it is, if I use their name. But if I say Ed Short, Rick Tyler, you don't just think of the name, you think of the person, the character, what they're like, what they look like, their characteristics, what they say, how they teach, how they speak, the things they do. So when it says, do not take the name of Jehovah your God in vain, it's not just talking about the, the word or the name Jehovah. It's talking about not to look upon his character in a worthless way. I want you to take a look at Job. Now, the book of Job, we know and understand, came, was actually written before Genesis. Chronologically, it comes afterward in the Bible, but it was written, it's older, this account took place it's older than when Moses wrote Genesis. Okay, so let's take a look. Job chapter 1, and I believe Moses wrote the book of Job. Some will say Ezra did, but I don't believe that's so. Job chapter 1, verse 5, it says, So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned. There's that word sinned. This is before the law because Job was written before Genesis. Have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now this word cursed is very closely related 
to the word that's used in the, first, in the third commandment about blaspheming God's name or using it in a worthless way or saying it in vain. Because this word, the word in vain means not using it in a worthless way, if you look it up in Strong's. And this word, they sinned and cursed God in their hearts. They treated God as worthless, is how that's defined. So we see that the third commandment existed before Sinai, even in Job's day. We get to the fourth commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Jehovah your God. You shall not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your maid servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, Jehovah blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it. Well, this raises the question, did the Sabbath exist before Moses went up to Sinai? I want you to notice there are three things God did on that day. He rested, he blessed it, and he sanctified it. That's what it says here in Exodus chapter 20. But notice that this commandment points back to Genesis. Let's take a look. In verse 11, notice it says, For in six days Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Right? That's What's that referring to? Back to Genesis. So let's go back to Genesis on the PowerPoint, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it or hallowed it or made it holy because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So did the Sabbath exist before Sinai? Absolutely. Absolutely. Also, we saw weeks ago when we looked at Exodus chapter 16, we looked at this. And he said to them, this is that which Jehovah has said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath to Jehovah. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil, because this was on preparation. This was actually on a Friday, the sixth day. And that which remains over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up until the morning, as Moses said, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm in it. This is speaking of the manna. And Moses said, eat that today. For today is a Sabbath to Jehovah. Today you shall not find it in the field. And then we look at, it continues. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it happened, some of the people went out on the seventh day in order to gather it, and they did not find any. And Jehovah said to Moses, pay attention to this, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, because Jehovah, he doesn't say, is going to give. He doesn't say, is, is giving it. It says, Jehovah has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you the bread of two days on the sixth day. Each one stay in his place. Let not any go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. A couple of things. When it says, don't go out of your place on the seventh day. It doesn't mean you can't leave your home. It means don't go out looking for manna on the seventh day because it's not out there. That's simply all that's saying. And notice it says in verse 28 once again, Jehovah said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Moses should have said, what commandments? I, I don't, you never gave us any commandments. But he didn't say that. Did the commandments exist? Well, we've discovered four of them. Let's keep going. I think it's important that we establish this. So again, this was before, what we're reading here was before they got to Sinai. He expected his people to obey his commandments, including the Sabbath commandment. And we saw even weeks before, I took you to Exodus 5.5, where when Pharaoh, he was talking about they wanted rest, and he says, I'm not going to give them that Sabbath. He used the word rest, which if you look it up in Hebrew, is Sabbath. It's interesting. Brings us to the fifth commandment. 
Fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long upon the land which Jehovah your God gives you. So once again, where do we go for this? We go back to Genesis. Genesis 28, 6 and 7 on the PowerPoint. And Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and had sent him to Paddan Aram in order to take a wife from there. And that as he blessed him, he gave him a command saying, you shall not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Paddan Aram. He obeyed. This is part of honoring your father and mother, obeying them. Let me ask you, when Eve ate the fruit, did she dishonor her father? Absolutely. She broke that commandment. She dishonored God. Adam did blatantly. The sixth commandment. You shall not kill. Now, that's from the modern King James. Uh, the, new, the authorized King James also says the same thing. Thou shalt not kill. The new, the new King James says you shall not murder, which is actually a, it's a better translation because this Hebrew word is ratsa, which means to kill in cold blood. There's a difference in killing someone in self-defense. If somebody's going to kill you and, you and you swipe them and push them out of the way from killing you with a sword and they fall and they get killed, well, you killed that person, but it wasn't in cold blood. It was in self-defense. Ratsa is a different type of word. It's what it's slaying someone, having slain someone, like Cain did to Abel. We looked at this earlier, but we'll look at it again. Well, no, we won't look at that again because we did look at it earlier where Cain killed Abel. God said, is sin crouching at the door, right? The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Well, we've already covered this one because we talked about Joseph. The eighth commandment, you shall not steal. This commandment was apparently on Jacob's mind because we discussed when he discussed his wages with Laban, notice what happens here. This is Jacob. This is before the Ten Commandments. This is Genesis, before the Ten Commandments were given at Sinai. This is Genesis 30, verse 33. So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. Before you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered what? Stolen, if it is with me. How could I steal something? If, if it's not a sin to steal, how could this be held against anybody? You see, so again, we see all of these elements of the Ten Commandments so far. They're, they're there. There must have been a law about stealing. Did Eve take something that wasn't hers when she took of the fruit? Well, just look at how many of the commandments go right back to the garden. She took something that wasn't hers. God says, all of these others are yours, but this one don't touch. It's off limits. The ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We mentioned earlier that Satan sinned from the beginning. He's the father of the lies. That's bearing false witness. Job, written earlier than Genesis account. I want you to notice, again, the following in the book of Job. But you are imputers of lies. You are all worthless healers. Job chapter 24, verse 25. And if it is not so, who will make me a liar? And my speech worth nothing. Again, Job 27, verse 4. My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor does my tongue utter deceit. What is deceit? It's a lie. This, this is... It's amazing how we can find these things if we look for them in Scripture. Again, in the book of Job, Job 34, 6, should I lie against my right? My wound is incurable without what? There's that word, transgression. If there was no law till Sinai, there could not have been transgression. Again, Job 36, 4, for truly my words shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. 
So the ninth commandment existed before Sinai. What about the tenth commandment? Here it is, Exodus 20, 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. In the Exodus wandering, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, notice the advice. We actually read this two weeks ago. Moreover, you shall select from all people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating what? Covetousness. And place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. And even before this, take a look. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Back to the garden. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was what? Pleasant to the eyes. And a tree desirable to make one wise. What did she do? She took, she stole, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. He ate. So this word desirable literally is to covet. She coveted the tree. She broke the Tenth Commandment. Which leads us back to James, chapter 2. If you break one, you've broken them all. So which one's not important to you? Which one do we decide today, you know what, it didn't exist till Sinai. It was only for the Jews. Was Eve a Jew? Was Cain a Jew? Was Jacob a Jew? No, the nation of Israel didn't exist. But you know, in God's eyes, Abel will be considered a Jew because he did God's will. You see, we're considered the seed of Abraham if we do the things of God. It's really quite beautiful how God has laid this out right from the very beginning. Somehow, the Bible doesn't tell us how, but in order for God to hold these people accountable for doing these sins, for committing those sins, for breaking any one of the Ten Commandments throughout that time before they were given at Sinai, somehow they were transmitted from Adam and Eve to their children. And somehow they knew. The Bible doesn't tell us how. But God said to Cain, sin lies at the door. Cain didn't say, what's sin? What, 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 what sin? What, 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 what sin lies at the door? No, Cain knew. How did he know? His mom and dad taught him. And this was transmitted through the years. It had to be in order for these people to know. How would Joseph have known it was a sin to commit adultery if that commandment didn't exist for hundreds of years after that? Because it was transmitted. It was given. It was audible. In fact, when God gave it, he didn't write it first. What did he do? He spoke it. He was teaching them the things that they had known from the past. And if they knew their history, they could recollect and say, oh yeah, I remember. I remember hearing those accounts of those things that happened. I know that's a sin. Oh, I can see why God says that's a sin. I can see why these things are wrong. Does that make sense? Am I, am I stretching the boundary of Scripture to say these things? Or are we going along with what the Bible actually says? Some people say, well, the Bible doesn't say that. Well, no, it, it does not say that they audibly had them. But they had to know somehow, whether he put it into their heart or whether it was spread audibly. One way or the other, they knew that these were sins. They knew it. The Ten Commandments, every one of them were known before Moses even walked the earth. Every one of them. And they're still important today. Do we believe God doesn't change? Is he the same yesterday, today, and forever, as it tells us in Malachi? If he is, then it doesn't change. The Ten Commandments did not originate with Moses at Sinai. It didn't originate at that time. The Ten Commandments are eternal. It's called the royal law in the Bible. In the New Testament... It's not limited to Jews. It is for anyone who wants to worship the true God. For anyone who identifies to be a worshiper of the true God. 
They reflect the character of God because they're all about love. The Ten Commandments show us not only how to love God within the first four commandments, but it shows us how to love our neighbor within the numbers five through ten. The two greatest commandments that Jesus gave, and he summed up the ten in just the two. How to love our man is in the last six. How to love our God is in the first four. God gave his laws for our good, and they're based on love. It's all about love. That's what it is. This God of love and his character is reflected in the very commandments that he carved in stone. We haven't got there yet in the accounts. We will get there. So I want you to look at a text, one last text. This is the last one, 1 John 5, 1 through 3. And Brother Rick read part of this for the scripture reading this morning. It says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begat also loves him who is begotten of him. So that's talking about the Father and the Son. Who's, who's the one who begot? Him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. The Son is begotten of God. Verse 2, by this we know that we, we love the children of God. When we love God and what? Keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Well, you know, it's just too hard for me to keep that commandment. That one's a little too tough, you know. Um, when I get near that uh, cash register and I see those little items in the line, I just have to steal me a pack of gum or, you know. Really? Does that even sound reasonable? Doesn't that sound silly? <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not breaking a commandment. I'm just, uh... we make excuses. Which one is not valid today? They're all valid. God has not changed. He doesn't change. The Ten Commandments, they did exist. All of them before Sinai. And they will exist eternally. Because within the commandments, we see the character and reflection and love of the one true God.